But it's not nice to look down with our ears. Right now on the National Weather Desk, moving east, Midwestern cities will now feel the impact of this relentless heat. And our nationwide team of meteorologists will help you better understand what's behind the heat as well as other weather issues. And it all has to do once again with our heat dome. This track will take it over towards the Carolinas and Georgia, so we'll need to watch that. The unexpected connection between seed collection and water quality at a popular spring. Through restoration efforts, we can make sure these lands are diverse and resilient in the face of climate change. Pest control, what you can do to try to keep them out of your home. Everything is uh, trying to get in out of the heat and seek water. And the unexpected discovery divers found in a Bahamian blue hole. From our nation's capital, this is the National Weather Desk. Good morning and welcome to the National Weather Desk. I'm Angela Brown. We start this morning with what seems like the never ending heat wave. The Southwest still baking, the Midwest simmering, and meteorologist Brian Vandergraaff is here with all the hot details. What's going on? Well, I'll tell you what, that heat that has been baking, you're right, the southwest and the central portion of the country, well, that heat is now going to expand eastward. And you're going to see this heat extend all the way from western portion of the United States to the midsection and right over to the northeastern portion of the U.S. as well. Heat advisories, excessive heat warnings up. Vegas and Phoenix, triple digits, 117 in Phoenix again today, 107 Dallas, 105 Kansas City. Even triple digits for down in Florida, that heat will move into the middle portion of the America and then into the mid-Atlantic, even the metro area of D.C., they could have feels like numbers near 107 by Friday. It's going to be a while before we break this pattern. Oh, that's hot. The extraordinary and really ongoing heat wave is setting records in so many cities. Meteorologist Ryan Miranda explains the science behind these oven-like temperatures. And it all has to do, once again, with our heat dome. And to really explain how these work, the sun heats up the surface of the earth and the surrounding air above it. Now, like a hot air balloon, hot air wants to rise up. But once it gets to the, to the top of the heat dome, it can't rise up anymore. And the air actually begins to sink downwards. And literally from the thermodynamics, the science and the physics behind the air, when it sinks, it also compresses and it warms. And that gives the heat dome its extra heating power to make these temperatures so much hotter. And if you're in a heat wave, your air conditioner is probably working overtime. Meteorologist Alan Seals posted this reminder right here on Facebook. The harder your AC works, the sooner you will probably need to change the filter. Alan says the filter on the right was new just 10 weeks ago. He normally goes four months before changing it. The heat wave is also taking a toll on many people who have to work outside, and that includes movers who endure demanding physical labor. Leanna Golden has more from El Paso. It's hard work. The door, you know? You're just gonna have to hold it. There you go. Made even more challenging in a seemingly never-ending heat wave. Gonna help him? Huh? Gonna help him? The movers of El Paso are not letting the triple digits slow them down. Today's a, uh, an actual commercial move. Owner Leo Orutia keeping a close eye on his employees, his daughter Cassandra included, making sure everyone's keeping cool as best they can. It is a toll on all of us, you know, uh, but we just got to keep hydrated, you know, just keep going because we've got to pay the bills. <laughs> In the truck, it's actually, it kind of like feels like you're suffocating a little bit. So right now we're in a 15-footer. Right now it's at 107 degrees. In the trailer, it does get hotter. See right here, it's 132. Sometimes it does burn our hands. Esto no bueno, not this. Usually when we do schools, we can go up to 20,000 steps a day. Make sure you, when you get home, you take your hot shower and just relax. If you're hurting, get some Bengay on there or, <laughs> you know, or something. Water breaks may be keeping them cool, but the crew says there's another key to getting the job done. We always do have fun, keep it fun. 
So that, that's how we move fast too. Here we go again. More smoke from the Canadian wildfires hovering over U.S. cities. You can see it here. The worst air today stretches from Minneapolis to Milwaukee and then Chicago. Meteorologist Violet Skybor looks at the numbers behind Canada's record-setting wildfire season. The Canadian wildfire season of 2023 is the worst on record. So far up to this date, 27 million acres are burned and it continues to grow as the season is not over. It beat the annual record of 18 million acres burned back in the year of 1989. And we may even double that by the end of this season. But why are we seeing so many more fires this year? Well, we had record hot temperatures and heat waves in the spring. Plus, June was the hottest month ever recorded on the planet. And it's not just this past June. Our temperatures continue to rise every year across the entire planet. And it's even worse for Canada. A recent study done shows that Canada has warmed twice as fast than the rest of the world in recent years. And that's due to the loss of snow and sea ice. Plus, with drier vegetation on the ground and these warming temperatures, that's only going to worsen the wildfire situation up in Canada. And Canada is also recovering from devastating floods. Three months of rain fell in just one day in Nova Scotia over the weekend. Two people were killed and two more are still missing this morning. The rain is believed to be the most to have fallen in Halifax since 1971. While in Greece, temperatures are back to about 104 degrees. More than 20,000 people have already evacuated from the islands of Rhodes and Corfu. The European Union, Turkey and Israel have all sent firefighters and also equipment to help battle all of these wildfires. The fires are simply so big, the smoke is visible. You can see it there from space. And in Italy, the main airport on the island of Sicily closed this morning after a wildfire broke out nearby. The Palermo airport has since reopened. Sicily has faced scorching temperatures amid the heat wave in southern Europe. But back here on U.S. soil, two people are injured and several buildings destroyed after storms hit southern Missouri on Monday. Initial evidence actually pointed to a tornado, but that has not been confirmed. Today's weather for the region calls for clear skies and also a high in the mid-90s. The Philippines is bracing for super typhoon Toksuri. It could make landfall tonight or early Wednesday morning local time. Officials say the super typhoon has winds of around 150 miles per hour and is the equivalent to a Category 4 Atlantic hurricane. You may remember. Hurricane Ann made landfall as a Category 1 storm near Myrtle Beach, South Carolina last September. The high winds and storm surge washed away sand dunes, leaving the coast open to even more damage. Officials have been working for months now, basically trying to restore the layer of protection. Emma Parkhouse has a look at how things are coming along. When Hurricane Ian made landfall in Myrtle Beach last September, it completely wiped out the sand dunes, fencing and seagrass lining along the coast. The dunes are our first line of defense in the event of a hurricane. They're good for that initial collision with the ocean when you get storm surge, and it slows it down a little bit, but it's also designed to wear away. The sand dunes will take that brunt and, and dissolve. If you As we near the peak of the 2023 hurricane season, Mark Krua with the city of Myrtle Beach says officials need to act quickly in restoring the dunes. We're going to get a full beach renourishment, but probably not until next year. So we needed to do something and we're going to put the sand dunes up. The seagrass goes in and that will help build dunes. Crews completed adding the new sand fencing on Saturday, months ahead of their expected schedule. This is the backup option. We need to start building sand dunes as best we can. It didn't co get completely flattened in Ian, but a lot of them were flattened in Ian. When the Army Corps of engineers completes a full beach renourishment in 2024. They'll bring in more sand to help build the dunes up, but until then, the fencing and planting more seagrass will start the process. The sand fencing catches the sand that the wind blows and helps build the dunes. And after a while, after five years, you can't even see the fence because the dunes have grown over the top of the fence. The seagrass also helps catch that wind blown sand and anchor those new dunes. The city has hired an outside contractor to put in one 150,000 new sprigs of seagrass behind the dunes. 
And check out this right here. Now, this is video. You can see it right here of a dust devil. Uh, this video was captured Monday in Arizona. Dust devils are a funnel-like chimney where hot air moves both upward and circularly. They are not the same thing as tornadoes, but they can still pack a really big punch. On September 14, 2000, a dust devil in Arizona was estimated to have wind speeds of 75 miles per hour and they are not just found on Earth. Apparently, dust devils can be found on Mars as well. And we love to share your weather content on the air. You can find us on all of your favorite social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Just search the National Weather Desk. And coming up on the National Weather Desk, soaring temperatures are forcing more pests into people's homes. We'll show you what you can do to keep them out of there. And we'll talk to an expert about how science study weather, scientists study weather from the past. I'm meteorologist Charlie Lopresti with Look at the Northeast. We have a nice day on tap in the Northeast today and tomorrow. There will, however, be some thunderstorms that develop. Most areas will top out in the 80s. We'll have elevated humidity today. We're starting off in the morning with a lot of sunshine. Should be a nice looking uh, start to the day. But notice a lot of these showers and thunderstorms popping up during the afternoon and evening. I think we have a lesser of a risk for some of those thunderstorms on Wednesday. We'll enjoy a lot of sun with highs in the 80s. Some areas may hit 90. I'm meteorologist Jonathan Myers, and here's a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. A quiet start for most, but notice even by lunchtime, a few spotty showers and thunderstorms along the Delmarva, eastern Virginia. Those only increase in coverage into the afternoon. Could even have a couple of severe storms around during the p.m. rush. That then moves east, and it looks like things quiet down into the early overnight hours. There's our latest weather maker, a little disturbance outside of thunderstorms, highs near 90. That's the scene here. I'm meteorologist Vetus Readers and look at your southeast forecast highs for the day. We're looking at 93 in Raleigh, 90 Charleston, Jacksonville, 92 degrees, Tampa, 94, Atlanta, 93, Mobile, 94 degrees. Hot temperatures, plenty of sunshine through much of the day across the southeast and Florida. Looks like there could be a few little pop-up afternoon showers and thunderstorms over the mountains of west, western portions of North Carolina, along the coastal regions, Jacksonville and down to the Florida. There'll be scattered showers and kind of tapering off through the evening and overnight. Weather Window, presented by the National Weather Desk. The next time you fly through clouds, take note of the types outside the plane and the difference in turbulence, say between a deck of alto cumulus clouds like you see here and developing cumulonimbus clouds, the latter which will likely have more turbulence. Back on the ground, this bear in Colorado seems to be enjoying a bath. All that's missing is a brush and a rubber ducky. Listen to Off the Radar, new episodes every Tuesday. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. A small but mighty workforce is helping improve the water quality at a popular spring-fed swimming hole in Austin, Texas. Meteorologist Chicago Windler explains how they're doing it one seed at a time. I'm standing on part of the 34,000 acres in Central Texas set aside to protect the groundwater underneath our feet. And just a handful of volunteers collecting seeds like this are making a real grassroots difference. The water at Barton Springs Pool is a popular place for Austinites trying to beat the heat. We really couldn't do it without you. 
20 miles south in Buda, an Austin Water Wildland Conservation event brings nature lovers to this vast stretch of protected savanna grassland. Oh, you have it in bloom. Volunteer coordinator Audrey Stewart says there's a direct connection between the health of this land and the water quality at Barton Springs. Any water in this area will go underground through cracks and holes in the limestone here upland where we are and also down in creeks and make its way underground uh, to Barton Springs. Wildflowers and native grasses can be harvested once they've gone to seed. Here's our silver blue stem. And now is the perfect time. Dry conditions and the heat will help cure it and make it really ready to collect. Weekly seed collecting events take place in the morning before it gets too hot. Extremely peaceful. That's probably my favorite part of coming out here is, is there's no traffic noise, there's no phones ringing. Volunteers like Clover Clammons helped harvest over 100 pounds of seed in previous years. It's fun because as an individual, this doesn't look like too terribly much, but when everyone comes together and and the weight of the seed is known. It's nice to be contributing. So next we'll take those seeds and store them in our seed house with low humidity um, and temperature control. And we'll later mix those seeds and put them back out on the land in parts that need them. Seed diversity you can't buy commercially, but you can painstakingly collect by hand. Through restoration efforts, we can make sure these lands are diverse and resilient in the face of climate change. A small team making a huge impact. Thank you for being here. South of Austin in Buda, Texas. I'm Chicago Windler for the National Weather Desk. Well, in some areas of the U.S., the heat is so intense it's pushing more pests into people's homes. Meteorologist Joe DiCarlo has a look at what you can do to keep these unwanted guests out of your house. Spiders, roaches, scorpions. The intense San Antonio heat pushing pests inside. Well, everything is uh, trying to get in out of the heat and seek water. And they don't need much room to sneak in. So your termite can get through a 30 second crack in a slab, 30 seconds of an inch. But filling that crack can cause other problems. A lot of homeowners make the mistake of blocking those weep holes. Blocking those weep holes, they're there for a reason. Those holes at the bottom of your bricks and of your rocks are there for the health of your home. It keeps the wall breathing. When you block that, you increase and encourage mold growth. So what can you do? We place a product in those weep holes that will still allow your wall to breathe, but not allow the pests to enter into the wall. And it's not just the small pests that are becoming a problem in this heat. Bigger animals such as raccoons are on the move as well. So we've seen an increase of uh, erratic animal behavior. Why? because they're normally in attics. Because you're looking at 150 degrees in your attic space. So these animals are now fleeing during the day when those temperatures rise to that point to crawl spaces, under decks, and places that are more hospitable. And they're finding cooler spots near your home. Under shady areas, uh, under barbecue pit covers, just panting, you know, just desperately trying to regulate body temperature. What can you do? You want to prevent that by screening off or blocking the undersides of decks, um, uh, any place that they could harbor. And these tips should come in handy for ticks. That's because according to a recent study, there are now more ticks than ever. And that's partially due to climate change. Some species of ticks carry diseases that can really be life-threatening, including Lyme disease. A tick bite can also cause you to be allergic to red meat. Experts say when you are at risk of exposure, cover your skin and tuck the bottom of your pants into your socks. And we're getting a little help from Mother Nature when it comes to pests. Venus flytraps are not on the endangered species list, thanks to successful protection and also management efforts. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service says the plant is not facing extinction. Management efforts like prescribed fires and voluntary conservation partnerships have really made a difference here. Scientists have been using blue holes and sink holes in the Bahamas to study ancient hurricanes. During one of those re research trips, they found something really unexpected, a human bone. Emily Gracie sat down with one of the researchers to find out more about this bone and also who it belongs to. So in 2014, we had our first real expedition to the Bahamas to sample you know, to collect sediment cores from the numerous blue holes in that environment. And it's a target rich environment. You know, you look at the map and there's blue holes and sinkholes all across the islands in the offshore region. So we just had a long list of ones we wanted to investigate and Great Cistern uh, sinkhole was just one of the ones on the list. 
So we show up, we sync our sediment cores, get them back to the lab, split them open. And sure enough, there's textual variability there, but there's also this large chunk of bone <laughs> just sitting right about 30 centimeters down from the top of the core. But, uh, you know, based on what we knew about the site, we realized very quickly that it was quite old. Did you know that it like it was a leg or did you have to do some research on that? We had to do some research on that. My uh, my background is in archaeology, but not in uh, osteology. Like I'm not an expert on bones at all. You know, at first we were like, is it a cow bone? <laughs> you know, but there aren't cows, there really aren't cows in the Bahamas. Um, so we had to do some research to figure out that, yeah, it was in fact a human bone. And we spoke to some other experts who were able to identify it conclusively as the uh, upper part of a tibia dating to an adolescent individual. So then, do you know how old this bone is? Yeah, so it is uh, <laughs> it's to about 1340 CE, right? But that was it was a little bit of detective work to figure out, okay, what contribution, you know, of, uh, the, of the marine diet versus the terrestrial, uh, you know, uh, plants and the Bahamas were, you know, did the Lucayans eat? And some previous work had been done to sort of suss that out. And we figure that, okay, taking what we know about the, uh, the contributions from the marine versus the terrestrial elements of their diet, and then what we know about the dating from the leaf matter above and below, we were able to say that it looks like this person got, you know, I think 67% or two thirds of their diet came from marine resources and one third came from terrestrial resources. And that gave us an age that locked us right into the middle of, uh, of uh, our other age constraints. And if you want to hear how this discovery changed what historians previously thought about human settlement in the Bahamas, check out this week's episode of Off the Radar. Richard shares the entire story of finding and dating the bone and talked about the impact weather and climate had on ancient civilizations. Find Off the Radar wherever you get your and listen to your podcast. And as we go to break, we take in the, the views of the Junita River in Pennsylvania. Junita? Good Tuesday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael, taking a look at your weather story as we go through the next few days here. So, triple digits in Wichita. I'm going to want you to watch as we go through the next couple of days because the triple digits are about to spread for us. So, for your Tuesday, we got a few thunderstorms up there in the Dakotas. By the time we get to the day tomorrow, those triple digits getting all the way up to Bismarck. Even St. Louis getting up to 100. Scattered thunderstorms across the lower Great Lakes for tomorrow. Some of those strong and hot for most of the area Thursday. Good morning, I'm meteorologist Alex Garcia. Here's a look at your regional weather. We're waking up a little bit on the warm side into the 70s and 80s for the most part. Cooler back over Louisiana and into Arkansas. A little bit of a trough fly will move south. We'll watch the sea breeze get active along the Texas coast. That could bring some showers into San Antonio, maybe even into Houston. Otherwise, temperatures are going to be warming back up to summertime levels by the afternoon. I'm meteorologist Alex Garcia. That's a look at your regional weather. Well, hi there and happy Tuesday morning to everybody. I'm meteorologist Shannon O'Donnell. The heat continues out in the desert southwest. Once again, we're nearly at a month at or above 110 in Phoenix. Today, shooting for 116. Not too much cooler up the road into Vegas at 111, 102 out of Albuquerque. Pacific Northwest, much cooler. Highs in the 70s today in Seattle as a cold front drops through the northwest and into Montana. And that's the scene from here.
Tracking the tropics this morning, the National Hurricane Center is watching a couple of disturbances in the Atlantic Ocean. Meteorologist Chad Sandwell has details. New systems we're watching this morning both have really pretty small chances to develop. This is the one we've been watching since late last week. Right now, the shear is continuing to rip that apart. 10% chance that developed, so the chances for development have gone down each of the last couple of days. And a new system that came up yesterday, Hurricane Center is watching this, giving it a 20% chance to develop. This track will take it over towards the Carolinas and Georgia, so we'll need to watch that. But again, the chance of development is fairly low. And dust from the Sahara Desert arrives in Texas today. That's going to impact people who suffer from allergies and asthma. San Antonio meteorologist Chris Suchan has more. It's a moderate concentration later in the day into the evening of Saharan dust. And then it's with us Wednesday, Thursday, Friday as well. Then finally thinning out as we go into the upcoming weekend. Now what that means is each and every day we're going to get hazy skies. Can cause some irritation for those sensitive to a moderate amount of Saharan dust as some of it does settle. It also gives an opportunity for some color rich sunrises and sunsets as long as the concentration of dust in the sky is not too thick, which would sort of drown out the sunrise and sunset color. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, July is National Blueberry Month, so tomorrow on the National Weather Desk, we head to Michigan to check, out, check in on this year's crop. I'm Angela Brown. Make it a great Tuesday. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.